Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, Japan. Rubble on the ground, radiation in the air. Striking similarity to the build-up ahead of the worst nuclear disaster in history at Chernobyl. The media struggle to cover a megastory. Pakistan, where two politicians have been killed for trying to reform blasphemy laws, and a third is in hiding. Libya, Bahrain, and Ivory Coast, all taking steps to silence critical voices in the media. And the politician and the actor come together in our web video of the week. They picked a fight with a warlock. <laughs> we begin this week with a seismic story that, according to many of the people covering it, is threatening to go nuclear. In the wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the historic earthquake in Japan, the real headline grabbers have been the slew of stories about radiation escaping from the country's damaged nuclear reactors. Those reports have been juxtaposed with soothing words from nuclear scientists who claim that the media's reports on the nuclear angle are overblown. Caught in the middle, news audiences for whom the constant comparisons of Fukushima with Chernobyl and Three Mile Island often confuse rather than clarify. Our starting point this week is the fault line that runs through the land of the rising sun and the chasm that lies between fact and what some are calling fiction in the reporting of the earthquake story. A massive earthquake has hit Japan, triggering a tsunami. The moment it happened, we knew it was going to be a big story. Initially, people thought a 9.0 magnitude earthquake was worrisome enough, but then we heard of this tsunami. It issued a tsunami warning not just for Japan, once again for Russia as well, Marcus Island. And now we have the nuclear disaster. When the leak becomes uncontrolled, that's the point of no return. And clearly this story has got a lot of traction. People are, you know, are interested in nuclear and are, are afraid of nuclear. Among the people who felt they had reason to fear were the journalists sent to cover the story. How far are we from Fukushima? What precautions are we taking? Well, we have been talking to a lot of advisors, experts on the nuclear situation in terms of a fallout. We've been in touch with the newsrooms. We have moved ourselves from the city of Sendai, which was just 40 kilometers from the Fukushima nuclear plant, to about 200 kilometers to the community of Atika on the other side of the coast. We are also looking at a possible airlift out of this area in the case that the situation worsens. News organizations have been understandably cautious when it comes to the safety of their teams in Japan. But most are basing their decisions on news reports. And there are all kinds of critics, scientists among them, who say much of the reporting exaggerates the nuclear threat. This, which is from tonight's Evening Standard, which is London's local uh, newspaper, survivors face cancer risk. Now, it is true that they are responding to what the government has been saying in Japan. But actually the cancer risk is very, very low. And the media, having talked to a lot of experts, should have realized by now that actually that's very, very unlikely to happen. Those who are right around the worst of the site could see immediately the effects of radiation poisoning. What do you do if that happens? Both uh, Fox News and, and CNN, we were following the, the, the websites for the first couple of days, and it would say, nu nuclear cloud over reactor, 10,000 dead. And, and then you'd read into the story and you'd say, well, the nuclear cloud is over the reactor, but the 10,000 people are dead from the earthquake. A lot of news organizations have done a, a pretty good job, actually, of talking to leading professors about what's actually going to happen. The core hasn't been breached. The dangers aren't minimal at the moment. So the professors are saying time and time again, this isn't a big problem. It will not get much worse than this. It's relatively safe and it can be contained. A dozen of these reactors have shut down uh, and have done what they were designed to do. But then the next day, it's still the top news story, as if, in fact, disaster was just around the corner. You say this is not a nuclear bomb, but would not the effects be the same as a nuclear bomb? Now comes word that the cooling system has failed at a second nuclear plant. I think the problem tends to be when the story gets abbreviated and, and, and headlined. The other thing is that people just really do not understand nuclear energy. The number two and number four reactors of the Fukushima Daiichi power station. Even the most informed newscasters are pretty much in the dark. And we go from a partial meltdown of the core to a full meltdown. The headlines have been thick with buzzwords like meltdown and Chernobyl. The situation does bear striking similarity to the build-up ahead of the worst nuclear disaster in history at Chernobyl. And there have been attempts to misinform. Three days after the quake, this fake text message raced across the Far East. 
It quoted the BBC predicting radioactive fallout would reach the Philippines within hours and advised Asians to stay indoors. Filipino news outlets busy covering a real story in Japan then had to debunk a fake story at home. It really spread very fast and even uh, I got the, the text message. And we knew right away when that text message made the rounds of uh, the metro that it was not true because we were monitoring BBC at that time and there was no such report. But of course, um, we had to have our experts really correct it and explain why it was impossible for the Philippines to be affected. The story was disproved, but not soon enough. A Manila university closed its doors for a day and canceled all classes. How can you blame them? People were scared, people were uh, fearful, but it was our job and we took it upon ourselves to really correct that report. News teams sent to Japan faced myriad logistical challenges. Disaster coverage entails functioning in countries whose infrastructures have been smashed. And no infrastructure, even Japan's, can withstand 9.0 on the Richter scale. There was an expectation that because this is Japan, one of the world's most technically advanced societies, that the situation would be better in terms of logistics. However, as soon as we touched down in Tokyo, we realized that gas was increasingly short. We had to ration our gas and limit our abilities to further go out to do some reporting. There were challenges of finding the basic necessities such as food and water. So a lot of challenges, the biggest challenge here were, was the logistics. The worst ever earthquake in a country that has felt many. The tsunami after effect. Entire towns and their people missing a half million Japanese living in shelters. Not the kind of story that is easily overshadowed, but that's what happens when a new name like Fukushima takes its place alongside other infamous nuclear datelines. Fukushima now is, is bracketed between Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. Three Mile Island was a less serious accident. There was no breach of containment. There was no release of radioactive material. Nobody in the public was, no workers were affected. Chernobyl was a disaster because there was no containment, that there was nuclear debris spread all over the world. Well, we're, we're between them now. That is where the story is at the moment, and that is where the Japanese hope it stays, so that they and the news media can spend less time talking about a nuclear disaster that has yet to happen, that the experts say will not happen, and more time dealing with a natural disaster that has. Our Global Village Voice is now on the coverage of Japan's earthquake. Without question, the best media coverage I've found to cover the Japanese crisis has been footage filmed by actual people out in the streets, people literally watching their towns being swept away, uh, people armed with this, which I think we're discovering is to be, is turning out to be one of the most powerful tools that human beings have had in centuries. The coverage so far is really not showing the, the extent of the humanitarian situation. We've seen the story so much dominated by the, the rapidly changing nuclear story that the normal interviews with survivors and the stories of their struggles are being hidden. The key word here at the moment is uncertainty. Uncertainty about further earthquakes, uncertainty about the status of the uh, nuclear power plant that's threatening to melt down. People are having, having to rely purely on how they feel rather than exactly what they know. If you've got an opinion on the news media that you'd like to get on the air as one of our global village voices, we suggest you join the thousands of our viewers who already follow us on Facebook and Twitter. They go to those sites to find out what stories we're working on so they can weigh in. Or you can just get in touch with us via email. We're at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. Our News Bites segment begins with a story about one of our own. An Al Jazeera cameraman, Ali Hassan Al Jabbar, is the first journalist to be killed in the Libyan conflict in what's being seen at the network's headquarters in Qatar as a targeted attack. <laughs> Al Jabbar was killed outside Benghazi when the car in which he and his team was traveling was sprayed by machine gun fire. Al Jazeera's director general, Wada Kanfar, reacted with uncompromising language. He said, our colleague was killed in the line of duty. We cannot be intimidated by this or any other assault. To those attempting to muzzle Al Jazeera's voice by their criminal acts, 
assassinating our staff or distorting our signal, we will continue to fulfill this mission at any cost. Three journalists in Libya working for BBC's Arabic language news channel were held for nearly 21 hours and, they say, subjected to beatings and mock executions. A CNN crew, including correspondent Nick Robertson, was detained at gunpoint. And the fate of at least six local Libyan journalists who are missing remains unclear. Bahrain's media are also suffering as the kingdom tries to contain the escalating protests there. Armed men reportedly ransacked the offices of an independent daily newspaper, Al Wasat, threatened its employees and damaged equipment so that the newspaper was unable to go to print. Al Wasat's editor, Mansoon Al Jamri, said that his paper had been targeted because of its reporting of the political demonstrations. Al Jamri was one of nine journalists on something called Bahrain's List of Dishonor that was circulating online. The list identified 25 people in total, calling them collaborators aiming to sell their country. Four government officials in Bahrain have now resigned their posts in protest over this week's crackdown on demonstrators. The situation in the West African country of Ivory Coast is getting worse, and so are conditions for the media. Ivorians went without a single newspaper to read for three days after soldiers loyal to the disputed president, Laurent Bagbo, raided the country's only newspaper distributor, Eddie Press. The soldiers prevented employees from delivering any newspaper seen as pro-Alassane Ouattara. He's the man who's widely considered to have defeated Bagbo in presidential elections last November. Eddie Press then decided to pull all newspapers from circulation. It was one part protest, one part security measure. Distribution resumed, though, after the National Press Council, which regulates Ivory Coast's print media, held talks with officials in President Bagbo's government. However, the media watchdog group, Reporters Without Borders, says it remains deeply concerned about the media situation in the country. The public face of the U.S. State Department, Philip Crowley, has been forced out of his job after criticizing the Pentagon's treatment of Private Bradley Manning. Manning, the U.S. soldier accused of leaking thousands of classified documents to WikiLeaks, is currently being held in a maximum security facility in Virginia under what his lawyer calls brutal conditions, even though Manning has yet to be convicted of anything. Crowley was speaking at a conference at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology when he said that the treatment of private Manning was, quote, ridiculous and counterproductive and stupid on the part of the Department of Defense, unquote. What Crowley did not know is that a BBC News journalist, Philippa Thomas, was in the audience. She posted his comments on her blog. Crowley was out of a job within days. However, he did not retract his comments on the Pentagon, saying he had just intended to highlight the broader, even strategic impact of discrete actions undertaken by national security agencies every day and their impact on our global standing and leadership. Israel has condemned the United Nations for planning to screen a film about the Palestine-Israel conflict at UN headquarters in New York. The film is called Miral. It's based on the real-life experiences of Rula Jebriel, a Palestinian journalist who grew up in a Jerusalem orphanage. Israel's UN delegation said in a statement that, quote, this is a clearly politicized decision of the UN, one that shows poor judgment and a lack of even-handedness, unquote. A UN spokesman has denied that the screening reflects any political agenda on the part of the UN. The film's director, Julian Schnabel, is Jewish, and he says he's a strong supporter of Israel. Of the film, he has said, obviously, it's a Palestinian story, but it's very important that an American Jewish person tell a Palestinian story. If we don't listen to the other side, we will never have peace. Pakistan is a country being pulled in different directions, and the divide between the Islamists, moderates, and liberals is reflected in the country's media. A prime example of that can be found in the coverage of the debates surrounding Pakistan's anti-blasphemy laws. The country's media can report on blasphemy cases, but the laws are so strict that reporters cannot detail the nature of the alleged crimes committed. They cannot even say what alleged blasphemers have been accused of saying. Politicians who try to reform the laws are paying with their lives, and the Pakistani media are being blamed for contributing to the climate of intolerance through provocative, sensationalist reporting and pandering to extremist voices. The Listening Post's Meenakshi Rabi now on Pakistan, the media, and a debate in which even talk of reforming the anti-blasphemy law is considered blasphemous. On the 4th of January, the governor of Pakistan's Punjab region, Salman Tasir, was shot dead. Governor Punjab par lagi. It was his bodyguard, Malik Mumtaz Kadri, who pulled the trigger. He told the police, this is the punishment for a blasphemer. 
There are people in Pakistan who accuse the media of being complicit in this crime. I think one of the most tragic developments in, in the recent history of Pakistan has been the way uh, the, the electronic media um, contributed to the vilification of Salman Taseer as this godless, infidel, pro-blasphemy politician. The most recent media storm over blasphemy began in November last year with the case of one woman, Asiya Noreen, also known as Asiya Bibi. Asiya Bibi par ilzam hai ke usne Quran e Paak aur Rasool e Paak ke shaan mein gustaakhi ki. The Christian villager was convicted under the anti-blasphemy law of insulting the Prophet Muhammad and was sentenced to death. The story got huge coverage, but the reporting was missing one vital piece of information. No one watching the coverage actually knew what she had said. The anti-blasphemy law is so strict that that cannot be reported. Initially, there were some conjectural reports of what she said, but because of the strangeness of the law, the clumsiness uh, of the law, if you were to repeat what the alleged blasphemer said, then you yourself would be liable for blasphemy. What we have is an allegation of blasphemy, uh, and on the word of someone who wasn't even there. And that's a problem often with these cases, is that they are filed by people who have the ability sometimes to actually fabricate uh, the quotes themselves. Uh, there's no there's not much of a burden of proof involved at all. Islam ke under the inability to report the evidence did not stop Pakistan's opinionated news channels from talking about the case in speculative and inflammatory terms. There was no investigative journalism here. There were just pundits coming on TV and these prime time slots were given to people who have hardline views and who are extremists. And, um, you know, and then and we had TV anchors screaming bloody murder. One of the loudest voices belonged to news anchor Meher Bukhari of the Urdu news channel Sama TV. A populist with an acute sense of her audience, Ms. Bukhari plays to the more fundamentalist segment of Pakistani society. When the late governor Salman Tasir called for a reduced sentence for Asiya Bibi, Ms. Bukhari invited him on her show and ripped into him. It was a one-on-one -on -one with Mr. Tasir, and she actually attacked him so badly on that show without any proof. She said that people are saying that you're Vajibul Qatal and you're a Western liberal and you Western liberals just want uh, to you know, uh, amend these blasphemy laws or repeal these blasphemy laws and you don't respect Islam, stuff like that, which she kept denying. And to top it all, she flourished a fatwa against Salman Tasir. Now this wasn't a fatwa issued by any leading authority in Pakistan. This was, uh, to use an analogy, something issued by a few rabble-rousing parish priests and presented as an edict from the Pope. Shehrbanu Tasir, the governor's daughter, saw the broadcast and witnessed the media aftermath. Six weeks later, her father was killed. Certainly in the days leading up to my father's murder, there were many editorials in Urdu newspapers calling him a blasphemer and calling for his death. So, I mean, I believe in freedom of speech and free media, but this has now become incitement to murder and hate speech masquerading under freedom of speech. But the violence didn't stop with Governor Tasir's assassination. Two months later, Pakistan's Minister for Religious Minorities, Shahbaz Bhatti, was gunned down as he drove to work. Bhatti had been outspoken against the death sentence on Asiya Bibi, the Christian woman convicted under the law. He had also been heading a committee looking into reforming the law. The Pakistani Taliban claimed responsibility for the murder and said he deserved it because he was a blasphemer. Bhatti had known he was a marked man. In the days after Salman Tasir was killed, he said as much to the BBC. Forces of darkness, forces of violence, forces of extremism cannot, cannot harass me, cannot threaten me, cannot uh, divert my attention. So you won't be silenced? Not at all.
Shabazz Bhatti's murder uh, did not invoke media ire overall, largely because he was a Christian and uh, so perhaps he was not one of the deserters of within the, the ranks of Muslims. But again, the media was trying to, to gloss over the hardcore, brutal realities of Pakistan that you have armed militant groups in this country who operate with impunity. Pakistan's media are still experiencing growing pains. The private TV industry exploded in size in early 2000, and they're not shy with their opinions. In the last years of Parvez Musharraf's military government, it was the electronic media that led the criticism of his administration. Mary designation. The government eventually fell in 2008. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, everybody. In the years since Musharraf, however, the number of media channels in Pakistan has multiplied and competition is intense. There are no extremists and moderates in the mainstream Pakistani media. There are people who are trying to get ratings. Meher Bukhari or any other, you know, television talk show host who speaks loudly and aggressively, they do so with a great sense of irresponsibility because they're not responsible for the quality of the discourse. They're responsible for delivering ratings. In addition to the governor of Punjab and the minister for religious minorities, there is a third politician for whom the blasphemy debate can prove dangerous. The former minister for information and broadcasting, Shari Rahman. Last November, Ms. Rahman tried to change the law and eliminate the mandatory death sentence for a blasphemy conviction. Having seen two of her colleagues killed, she has withdrawn the bill and has gone into hiding. Sherry is underground. I mean, she's not coming out in public because after Mr. Tassi was killed uh, and now that Mr. Bhatti has been killed, she is the next on the hit list. It's scary because out of these three people, now there's only one person left. And um, in a country like Pakistan, we need our heroes alive. More Global Village voices now on the trouble with Pakistan's anti-blasphemy laws. Pakistani media has taken a very prudent approach towards highlighting various aspects related to blasphemy law. We must also realize that Pakistan's largest religious political party in the parliament has recently agreed to debate on the blasphemy law. And the credit must be given to the Pakistani media for creating this tolerance. Pakistani media has largely failed to educate the people about the blasphemy laws. It has also failed to raise some very important issues such as the nature and extent of religious radicalization in Pakistan and the overall direction of that country. Most media organizations have blamed the government for the deteriorating security situation in Pakistan, but they have never tried to mold the public opinion against these militant outfits themselves. By showing Salman Taseer's murderer with his acolytes being welcomed in public, what the media did were to restructure the popular desire in a way that any young person who's prone to these kind of heroic imaginations could now think that if he could also find some blasphemer to kill, maybe he would also become a hero. Finally, over the past month, while much of the world's news media has been focused on the Libya story, we've been hearing complaints about the American media's obsession with Charlie Sheen. Sheen's a comic actor, a veteran of Hollywood rehab clinics whose latest fall from sobriety and penchant for ranting led CBS to can him and his very successful TV show. While well, the people at FunnyOrDie.com have come up with a way of combining the Sheen and Gaddafi stories by intercutting interviews that the two have done and making it look like the actor is interviewing the Libyan leader and leaving audiences to decide which of the two men is more stable. We'll see you next time at the listening post. People are begging for an answer to these questions. Would you please explain what you meant by your statement, quote, they are not my problem. They love me, all my people with me. They love me all. I take uh, great umbrage with that. You don't understand. And the world don't understand the system here. I mean, come on, bro. I want best picture at 20. I wasn't even trying. Winning. They, they, they will die to, to protect me and my, my people. And if people think I'm insane, then I have no interest in, in, in their uh, retarded opinions, I really don't. I'm going to live my life the way I want. I'm going to win inside of every it's moment. It's a guy day. It's a guy day. Look at me. Duh. They, they came from outside. They picked a fight with a warlock. <laughs> well, do you borrow my brain for five seconds and just be like, dude, can't handle it. Because it just, it fires in a way that is, um, I don't know, maybe not from this particular 
uh, terrestrial uh, realm. <laughs> Now, what is the question? 